B-films have always been the wild west of the American movie landscape, even more so during the repressive Hayes Code era of the 1940s and 1950s. While mainstream and even independent films were often beholden to censors and critics and the public, the B industry blazed its own trail. Uh, granted, it was a much cheaper trail, kind of like a bad dirt track, actually. There's some awesome B-movies out there, and many of the productions were training grounds for some of America's best-known filmmakers. The studio of Roger Corman started the careers of Francis Ford Coppola, Jack Nicholson, James Cameron, and many, many others. The relationship between Hollywood mainstream and B-production has always been dynamic and symbiotic. Historically, B-films have been a proving ground for the box office, testing out new talent and techniques while pushing censorship and creative boundaries at every turn. And so this is a key reason why we're looking at B-movie title design. The whole B-movie form is a pure expression of a truly dynamic media. It was a constantly evolving form that was super responsive to the changing audience desires, to changing technology, and it really embodies the idea of sensing opportunity and chasing it. Also, it's full of energy and ideas, and some of these ideas might look pretty terrible now, but the energy and enthusiasm is hard to fault. Unable to rely on substance alone, B Productions mastered the art of marketplace recognition through bold slogans and type design, shocking imagery and loud colours. These graphic conceits were often mirrored in the film's opening title sequences, which vary wildly in technique and creative ambition, but almost always work overtime to make up for the films themselves. So B titles were often far more integral to the film than their A-list counterparts, which were more likely to deliver on their promise of, of engaging entertainment. The non-existent budgets of B-movie titles often invited novice designers and craftsmen from other trades, and of course, no budget meant they relied heavily on innovation and experimentation, leading to offbeat and unexpected results that would eventually come to define their respective genres. Many of these tropes would make their way into the language of mainstream title design. At the beginning of the 1940s, Hollywood was reworking its marketing formula. The end of the recession meant a larger potential audience with a wider range of interests, and so the big studios like MGM began exploring new genres and revisiting old ones. European cinema had come into its own a decade before, offering a trove of new techniques and concepts to a plateaued US industry, as well as an injection of new talent such as artists like Oscar Fischinger. German Expressionism in particular, with its crooked angles and heavy shadows, proved a perfect match with US crime thrillers, which were previously shot with the detachment of a soap opera. This new breed of crime film became known as film noir, and more than any other genre, film noir is responsible for the emergence of the B-film, as it appealed to a younger generation of, of filmgoers whose buying powers have increased interest to the studios. It was through noir that studios were able to extract maximum profit from minimum investment. Producing a noir was cheap, low-rent sets like offices and apartments, urban locales and minimal lighting made for easy shoots. Title sequences for noir B-films largely borrowed credibility from their A their A counterparts, just static text on screen. There was little incentive for them to do anything different, as most theatres didn't even open their curtains until the credits had ended. The very idea that a title sequence could be used as more than just a decorative front for legal copy was simply unheard of. However, on the fringes, experiments were underway. Arthur Dreyfus' The Payoff is one of the first crime thr thrillers to feature a novel, self-aware title sequence in which the credits are printed alongside headlines in the fictitious Courier newspaper, linking the narrative to the production itself. Tactile, situational type solutions would become a hallmark of noir title design, grounding their films at a street level. Mystery and suspense films, which had always been more attuned to the potential of film packaging, were among the first to exploit their title real estate. Phil Rosen's Murder by Invitation from 1941 features a sequence in which practical fire, real fire, consumes the cellophane title cards in succession. Few sequences before this had thought to physically manipulate the title cards themselves. Optical type distortion, which was achieved by photographing the title plates through water, gels or warped glass, would become a hallmark of many B genre titles in the 1940s and further on. Think back to Ferdinand Leger's use of this device in Ballet Mécanique in 1923, and you start to see a lineage of connection between these experimental processes. 
Steve Seckley's Lady in the Death House in 1944 showcases its potential in this context, warping type to create hypnotic layered transitions between cards. Shooting titles in this way creates a dreamlike quality that perfectly sets the stage for fantasy films or other stories that require a viewer's suspension of disbelief. Compound optical effects achieved in post-production when strips of pre-exposed film were sandwiched together to create composite images and layered transitions had been a favourite technique of the avant-garde for decades. Filmmakers like Hans Richter, Walter Ruttmann, they created visceral modernist graphic animations using these techniques in a way that ends up becoming very compatible with film title design. Early commercial adaptations include Elliot Nugent's The Crystal Ball from 1943, in which the titles appear to be wiped from a glowing orb by a pair of silhouetted hands. In Edward Ludwig's racing film The Big Will from 1949, the cards are wiped away by a chequered flag, both of which, both the chequered flag and the title cards, are superimposed over a live action backdrop. And The Big Will is also emblematic of B-movies expansion into new territory at the end of the decade, reaching out to meet the rise of drive-in culture and the demands of a mostly teenage audience. By the end of World War II, American audiences had grown weary of the bleak realism of film noir, instead turning to science fiction and horror as a means of escape. An age of science, defined by atomic warfare and the impending space race, fueled a curiosity for all things from another world. Aliens from outer space, invisible with two heads. B films and their titles began to set the tone and direction for these genres. And even with an extreme budget limitations, title designers were beginning to devise transitions, optical effects, and crude animation techniques to strengthen their, their delivery. Films like Unknown World uh, from 1951 and Flight to Mars, also from 1951, are among the first sci-fis to feature integrated title sequences with immersive genre-specific uh, themes and typography. The Thing from Another World, again 1951, features a dramatic sequence in which the title is eroded from darkness, an effect co-opted by its two A-budget remakes which occurred most recently in 2011. While creative innovations like these permeated early 1950s B titles, it wouldn't be until the latter half of the decade that title sequences would emerge as self-contained thematic units, inspired in part by the success of mainstream title design pioneers like Saul Bass and Morris Binder. Coming from both graphic design and film marketing backgrounds, Binder and Bass elevated the profile of the title sequence by merging artistry with narrative and conceptual threads from the film, distilling the essence of the film into a singular, potent visual statement. This format became the new standard for creative title design, fueled in equal part by industry and audience demand. In parallel to this, the animation boom of the 1940s through Disney and Warner Brothers gave rise to an entire commercial animation industry in the 1950s. Animation moved beyond association with just fairy tales and cartoons, fusing modernist sensibilities with experimental techniques and developing its own language. Paul Julian, a Warner Brothers veteran who'd worked on mainly Looney Tunes cartoons and is probably best known as the voice of the Roadrunner, migrated into title design in the late 1950s. Working exclusively with the notorious Roger Corman, Julian's narrative background and unique mixed-media animation style lent his sequences a tonal depth and complexity that was not previously seen in B-title design. Julian's first sequence, Swamp Women from 1956, combines practical camera moves with multi-plane illustrations and cross-dissolve animation. His experience as a background artist is evident in its design, with the titles themselves passive to the immersive, abstract backdrops, leading the viewer into the world of the film. Julian continues to explore similar techniques and themes in his sequence for Corman's Attack of the Crab Monsters the, the following year, combining even more layers of optical animation and motivated camera moves to create a sense of urgency and mystery throughout the entire sequence. And in Not of This Earth, in 1957, Julian uses details of human peril, blood, clawing hands, a crumbling skeleton, to contrast with the disembodied set of watchful alien eyes, establishing the tone of the film through allegory and abstraction. While Julian's use of type remains largely static throughout his short-lived titling career, his contemporary Bill Martin, who was also a frequent Roger Corman collaborator, regularly used dynamic typography as a component of his titles. 
Martin's title sequence for Corman's Carnival Rock in 1957 uses a carnival theme to showcase the credits, placing them into the environment as features of the carnival itself. Using a combination of optical and stop frame animation in conjunction with timed camera moves, he builds a sequence that's as engaging as it is complex, shuttled between the worlds of animation and modern design. It was a novel concept in the 50s, but one that would become more common in the years to follow, as evidence in Saul Bass' title design for films such as It's a Mad, 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 Mad World in 1963, and the Pink Panther series, also 1963. Martin's affection for experimental techniques is on full display in his titles for Corman's Teenage Caveman from 1958, which features illustrated backdrops, cross-dissolve animation, optical art artifacts, split-screen compositing, and live action graphic elements all working in concert with B veteran Hourglass's imposing music score. Elsewhere, B films were beginning to use title sequences for backstory, placing title cards over plot relevant vignettes. This became particularly useful for sci-fi films which often couldn't afford extended visual effects sequences. In a prime example, Martin's sequence for Night of the Blood Beast from 1958 features an accurate space shuttle separation sequence that happened years prior to the actual shuttle program. The title summarises the entirety of a space-bound crew's mission, leaving the rest of the film to unfold on a claustrophobic and very, very cheap series of studio sets. So we can see a number of innovations pioneered in the B-movie title design of this period of the 1940s and 1950s. The title was used for backstory. Designers used experimental techniques. They incorporated animation and multiple kind of different forms of moving image. They used techniques from fine art. They moved text on screen. They created bold and stylized designs. All of this represented the emergence of a design language that set audience expectation in terms of the film they were about to watch. And B-movie title designers came from diverse backgrounds, from fine art, from film marketing, graphic design and other areas. And they came up with unexpected ways of engaging audiences from the very outset of the film. While so many B titles are now forgotten or comical curiosities, hopefully this lecture has been a little reminder that they set the tone for a convergent media where art, film and advertising came together in one site and unfolded so many possibilities for the creation of a dynamic media design.